Okay, so what philosophers, what we're really good at is building arguments and taking apart arguments. That's what I've been trained to do. And this is going to be really important for you in these next five weeks because that's what you're primarily going to be focused on is what are the arguments regarding ethics. So how do you evaluate something that somebody says that has a moral component to it? If somebody says it's right or wrong or good or bad, how do you check that? So that's what we're going to go over and that's why we're going to use logic. So what is moral reasoning then? And this is, I'm taking this from Vaughn in the PDF. He's saying that moral reasoning is critical reasoning applied to moral arguments. Which is another way of what I just said, where I'm going to analyze exactly this argument regarding whether something is good or bad or right or wrong. And what am I analyzing? The arguments and the statements that make that argument, that construct or constitute that argument. So statements and arguments are really important. That's what you're gonna be examining, but they're not the same thing. Make sure you understand the difference between statements and arguments. And this is why I take the time too to go through this because um, we're going to be talking about ethical issues, right? There's a lot of ethical issues going on right now. Uh, people get very heated about it, but what I want from this course is actually real reasoned arguments and clear logical uh, support for something. This is not about a shouting fest and a bunch of opinions. You'll find out quickly that this class is not about opinions. Um, I tell my classes, my face-to-face -face classes, I'm not trying to be mean. I just don't give a shit about your opinions. Why? Because opinions don't prove anything. What I'm interested in is facts, not opinions. I can't grade opinions. I can't give you an A for an opinion, but I can give you a grade to see how well your facts build up to your argument, right? So that's what I'm looking for. So in order to do that, we're going to need logic. So logic is a normative endeavor. What that means is that it's an, based on an ideal standard. This is, I think, a lot of the confusion that people have, is that when I talk about reasoning through an argument or constructing a good logical argument, why it's not just a bunch of opinions is that it has to be, it has to meet some sort of standard. It has to measure up to what is a good argument. And so for, to do that, you have to think logically. Now, this is, this is where people get confused. Logic is about how you ought to think, right? It's normative, how you should think. Logic is not about how you think in your everyday life. Those are two different things. So I have, a, I have a, another degree in psychology as well. Psychology is about describing how people think, right? In general. Then logic is about how you should think, not how you actually think, because it's pretty clear from our president and all, a lot of other stuff, people are not thinking very well. So how do I know that they're not thinking very well? There has to be some ideal standard of what is correct way of thinking. Logic is about. So there's two types of logic in general. It's not comprehensive because of course it's five weeks. We don't have time to cover. That's for my next semester. If you're interested and I highly recommend it, take logic. But in general, you can break logic into two sections. Formal logic, which is what we're gonna be going over, and informal logic, which we'll, we'll end off with. Now, formal logic is based on a formal language. That is different than a natural language. So a natural language is like English or Spanish. 
formal languages are fixed languages. They are the meanings and the syntax and everything is already predetermined. So you notice that Spanish spoken here on the border is not the same Spanish that's spoken in Spain. The words don't mean the same thing sometimes. My cousin found that out very directly, what words you can use and what words you can use. But it changes on the, the situation, right? Formal languages don't change. The rules are set and everybody has to follow those particular rules. So other normative fields, if I go back for a second, logic is normative, mathematics is normative. If you take math, math is a language. It has its rules fixed. Notice that if you take algebra here, or you take algebra in China, or you take algebra in South Korea, it's the same thing. The rules are fixed. The symbols mean the same thing. That's why it's not a natural language. That's why it's not changing. Now, this is the hard part. This is only to get you guys to try to do. How do you translate? Translation is very difficult. How do you translate a natural language, something written in English or Spanish, into a formal language like mathematics and logic? This is why I think many students have a difficulty with word problems in math. Because in a word problem, what do you have to do? Why are word problems, why do people find word problems difficult? Interpreting or? Right, because you're gonna take the, that, that paragraph, right? Written in English or Spanish or something, right? And you're gonna turn it into a mathematical problem, right? Mm -hmm. But you see how, where it gets confusing for people. Yeah, very confused. <laughs> So this is hopefully will help. I think this is why I recommend everybody take logic. If you're struggling in math, it's because no one's ever taught you logic. <laughs> like, well, this is why mathematicians, I said, have to take logic as well, not just philosophers. Because it's, it's a way to teach you how to translate and how to see the logic past the words. So that's why we're gonna learn this new language of formal logic. It's a formal language. And what we're going to be looking at is statements and arguments. So is this a true statement? Is this a false statement? Is this a good argument? Is this not a good argument? That's what we're going to be looking at. So what an argument is for this class, I'll make this clear, is that it is a collection of statements that support a particular conclusion. That's what Vaughn is saying in the PDF. So to give you a really basic example, if John killed Bill in self-defense, then he did not commit murder. He did act in self-defense, therefore he did not commit murder. This is a very straightforward argument because it has a conclusion. What's the conclusion? Can somebody tell me of the conclusion? He didn't commit uh, murder. Right. He didn't commit murder. And how do we know that? How do we know if that's true or not? Because the Prometheus conclude that part or because it's therefore? The, the premise is supported, the right? The premise is, uh -huh. So it says, if he killed them in self-defense, then that doesn't count as murder, right? He did, in fact, act in self-defense, so therefore we're sure that it's not murder. This is basically, if you notice, an episode of Law and Order. Like, this is why lawyers have to take logic with us, because court cases are actually very easy for the most part. What's difficult is finding the evidence. But the case and the logic behind it is usually simple. Did he not commit, did he commit murder or not? Was it self-defense or not? 
But able to prove that, that's where it gets. And that's exactly why we're talking about ethical issues right now, right, in the news and what's going on around us. How do you prove whether it is justified or not? So that's what I mean by an argument. You have a conclusion and you're backing it up with some factual evidence. What an argument is not is if you just get any random claims or statements. You can't just get any things to facts together and say that's an argument. It has to lead to the, like, how does it support the conclusion? If I just add something extra to it, right? Well, the woman across the street had a red t-shirt on. That has nothing to do with, it might be true, but it has nothing to do with whether they commit murder or not, right? Not relevant to the issue. This is why I said opinions are not arguments. <laughs> and this is why I have to stress. If you say, well, I think he's innocent, that's great for you. But that doesn't prove that he's innocent, right? So that's the difference. I'm looking for proof. I'm not looking for opinions. And when people get heated, and this is why I teach logic, when I teach ethics, it's not necessarily an argument. People can yell at each other. I mean, if you've ever been in a relationship, you know what I'm talking about. You're yelling at each other for like a half an hour and then you realize you don't actually disagree. You just misunderstood each other. Like, oh, that's what you're saying? Oh, I thought you were saying something else. So you just wasted like a half an hour of your life yelling at each other because of a misunderstanding, not because you actually had a real argument. So that's what I mean by argument. Is it a clear conclusion based on some evidence? So how do you build arguments? I use the analogy, I hope this is helpful for students. It's like building a house. To build a house, you need materials, right? And you also need a blueprint, a plan. Those are the two elements of building a good house, right? You want it to hold up. Same thing with an argument. What are your materials here? You can think of them as your statements, your facts. You want to make sure that they're true, that they're not false. So this is what I mean by statements or claims. Statements or claims can only be true or false. Now the structure of the argument, how it all fits together, we call that valid or invalid structures. So valid structure does give you conclusive support for that conclusion. It backs it up clearly. Invalid structures don't give you 100% conclusive support. Now, there's a special case. If you have a situation where the argument, all the statements, all the facts that they have are true, and the structure is valid, it is what we call a sound argument. That's a perfect argument. That's where you can be guaranteed that the conclusion is 100% true because all the facts were true that they mentioned and the structure, the framework, how they got to that conclusion is certain. So don't get those terms mixed up. Make sure you understand those terms. Those will definitely be on the quiz. I'll tell you right now. Statements or claims can be true or false. Structures can be valid. If you say that, oh, that argument is valid, I'm sorry, that statement is valid? That's incorrect. People do say that, but it's incorrect. The statement cannot be, the structure can be valid, but the statement is either true or false. Now, sound arguments, both conditions have to be met. Everything has to be true, and the structure has to be valid to get you a sound argument, perfect argument. And it's 100% perfect. No one can disprove a sound argument. If it's a true sound argument, not even God can disprove a sound argument. And that was already worked out by medieval philosophers. Because all the medieval philosophers in Europe, guess what? We're priests and monks. So they've already thought it out. Can God disprove a perfect argument? No, because it's perfect. You can't disprove perfection. Now, this is where we get, this is where we start building up into what I'm saying. It's a very formal language like mathematics, okay? So I said statements or claims are true or false. These are facts. Now, things that are not true or false, 
questions cannot be true or false because you're asking something, right? You don't know it. So if you see a question, it can't be really used as support for an argument because it's not a fact. It's not something you're working with. Utterances. If you just yell out random stuff, chocolate, okay, but that's not true or false. So what we're looking for are just the statements. So imagine that you are a lawyer you're, and you're thinking about a case. What are the facts, right? You're, so random information, utterances, those are not helpful. You're looking for what are the facts here in a case. So ask yourself, is this can be true or false? That's what you want to pay attention to. Now, this is where we get like mathematics. So, you know, in algebra, you have variables, right? What are the variables in algebra? Somebody tell me. X, Y, Z. Right. And what do they stand for? Yeah. Why do we use variables? Why what? Why do we use variables? To substitute a number or when we don't know the number? Right. And you're substituting a value, right? Uh -huh. Numeric value. The same thing is going on here in formal logic, except instead of a numerical value, you're substituting true or false a truth value. So if, and this is how we work with formal logic. Instead of X, Y, and Z, we start in the alphabet P, Q, and R, and we go down. So the first variable that we would use is P. So if I say P, you're an EPC student, what's the truth value to that? What's P's truth value? Is it true or false? True. I hope so, unless you guys are just like hanging out on Zoom. You're not in this. <laughs> yes, it's true, right? Now, mm -hmm. you're a Facebook member. That might be different, right? Right. So the value, the truth value depends on the statement. So just like in math, X is not the same thing as Y. They're two different numbers, right? Right different values or they could have the same value but it depends on the situation right same mm -hmm. thing here when you see these values, these variables they can have different values depends on what it's representing so i'll show you what i mean when we get to the operators so when you have a math problem very simple math problem if you have two and you also have another two, what would be the solution? But, but you are adding or you are, what are you doing? Exactly. That's, what is, what are those things called? Where we add, subtract, multiply, or divide? What are they called? They have a name. because they're what they're operators so operators tell you what to do with those values right mm -hmm. how to operate on them it's the same thing with logic but we have our own operators they will change the true or falsity of the sentence depending on what operator you're using so, for example, you're an EPC student and a Facebook member. So we have two statements here, right? Right. Going along with what I told you right now about variables, what's the first variable that we use? P. P. So you're an EPC student will be P. So if I rewrite it just using variables, I would say P and what? Q. Now, if I say P and Q, what has to be true in order for the whole sentence to be true? Mm 
Think about it. What is the and? The, the and is your operator, right? So let's say it's true that you're a student, but it's false that you're a member of Blackboard. What would the sentence be, true or false? Is true. Right? False. Think about it. If I said your student, oh, and she's a member of, Black, uh, of Facebook, but you're not a member of Facebook, would that be, would that be true? No, right? This is the part of and. And is connecting these two statements together. When it connects these two statements together, you can't separate them anymore. So then now the whole value changes, right? Because the and is in the middle. Right. So both sentences have, I'm sorry, both statements have to be true in order for the whole sentence to be true. See how one side is false? It doesn't work? Right. So that's what I'm saying. It gets very technical, but this is where we're starting. And if you have an and, you're going to have to, these two are connected. You can't take them apart anymore. So you have to take the whole thing. What is helpful, I think, for some students is that if you put parentheses, right, tell you where, Put parentheses around the whole sentence if you see an end in the middle, because then I'm going to have to look at both parts, right? As one big piece. Yeah. Now, or is the next operator. You say your student or a Facebook member. So P or Q, right? Right. So if it's true that you're a student, but it's false that you're a member of Facebook, then the whole thing is what? True. True. Yeah, it's true. It's P or Q, right? Mm -hmm. So just one of them. Right. But what happens if I said both are true? P is true or Q is true, and they're both true. So... Is false because both are true? It depends. It depends on what type of or. There's two types of ors in logic. Exclusive or and inclusive or. Exclusive or, you're excluding something. So you're saying it's one or the other. One or the other, yeah. Inclusive or, you're saying it's one or the other or both because mm -hmm. you're including. But do you notice how in English you can't tell the difference? So and how do you know when the question is exclusive or inclusive? I would ask. This is a trick. This is what I'm saying. Lawyers, when they construct contracts, right? And people don't understand what they signed. Yeah. And it says, or, and they're like, well, I thought it was just one or the other. It's like, well, that's not what it meant. Mm -hmm. So this is why when I sign something, I say, wait a minute, is this inclusive or exclusive or? Like, what am I signing here? So this is why, this is why it's a benefit for logic. We, when we translate it, we make sure what kind of war we're talking about. In rare, everyday regular English, we were not careful like that. And so this is where we make mistakes. This is why I said logic is about how you should think, not how you really think. Because we make a bunch of assumptions. So exclusive or remember, it has to be one or the other. Inclusive or it's one or the other or both. And as a tip, in math class, it's usually inclusive or. So if you're working a word problem in math, they mean one or the other or both. You see how they don't tell you that in math class? <laughs> but it's really helpful if you understand. 
what they yeah. mean. So when you're answering the question and it has an or, it could be three options, P mm -hmm. or Q or P and Q. So these are two most common operators. You see an and or. Now, if then is where everybody gets scared. Because if then is really not intuitive. Like, it's not the way our brains work. We're not, we have a hard time wrapping our heads around if then. So if then is called a conditional statement. So if this happens, then this will happen, right? Saying based on this condition, then this will be the effect. So mm -hmm. if you're an EPC student, then you're a member of Blackboard. Sure. Right. So if it's true that you're a student, then if true, you're a member of Blackboard because as soon as you register as a student, you're automatically mm -hmm. included into Blackboard. Right. Now, if it was true that you're a student, then it was false that you're a member of Blackboard, what would the whole thing be? False. False, right? Mm -hmm. Now, switch it. If it's false that you're an EPC student, but then it's true that you're a member of Blackboard, what, what would the whole thing be? True or false? False. True. Think about, think about it for a second. If, is it possible that you're not a student in EPCC, but then you are a member of Blackboard? Is that possible? No. If you're a student at UTEP, what will you use? What do you use at UTEP? I it's think not Blackboard, Blackboard, right? It's Blackboard? Oh. Hmm. So okay. it's possible, right? Right. You see how this is what I'm saying. This is why it's not, don't trust your intuition. Don't go with what you think. This is why logic is like mathematics. You're going to have to think about this for a second. So, I mean, it's also true, right? If you're a student, then you're a member of Blackboard. It could be me as well, right? I'm a member of right. Blackboard. Right. Like, you're not a student. So, Think about the best way I can kind of try to summarize this is like cause and effect. It's saying, if you have this cause, then you're gonna have this effect. But that's not the only cause that can make this effect, right? There could be other causes. Other things can make you a Blackboard member, not just being a student of EPCC. Right. So they're connected, the if and then, when you see if and then, they're connected that way. That's why it's not really easy right away to determine whether the whole thing is true or false. Now, if they're both false, what would it be? You're not a student at EZC, then you're not a member of Blackboard. What would the whole sentence be? They're both false statements. <laughs> If they're both false, then the whole thing would be what? True or false? True, right? True. Okay. Because you're saying this condition, well, if this didn't happen, then this didn't happen, right? Right. But be careful. You're going to see a lot of if and then in the, in the book. A lot of arguments rely on if and then. And interesting enough, this is how computers work as well, FYI. This is how I program. If I want my robot to clean the floor, then if the floor is dirty, then the robot will clean. If the floor is not dirty, right, then the robot will not clean. Same programming logic. Computers use the same thing. Now, not is simple but very weird. Not is you're negating. You're saying whatever it is, it's the opposite. So it is not the case you're an EPC student. So what would the whole thing be? True or false? Mm. 
what would be the sentence? Would it be true or would it be, a, would it be a true sentence or a false sentence? I want to say true. That you're not a student? It is not the case that you are. Oh, no. I am a student, so it would be false. It would be false. So what, this is the important part of the not. Whatever comes after the not, it will flip the sign. It will change it to its opposite. So it's true that you're a student, right? Right. If you say not true, what's another way of saying not true? False. Right. So the whole thing is false, right? Mm -hmm. So you can do this in logic, but you can't do this in English. If I said, I'm not, not a liar, what does that mean? False. I'm not, not a liar. I have two nots. Not. So if I had liar and I said not a liar, that would be what? Just one not? Yeah, one not. So false. Yeah, but if I have another not in front of it? True. It flips it again. See, it's a double negative. If I, imagine your, your partner and they're like, oh, I did not not lie. What? <laughs> If they say, I did not, not lie, meant they what? They lied. Yeah, it's, it's true that they lied. See how this helps you in regular life? <laughs> You'll so, be able to tell when someone's lying to you. <laughs> well, if they start contradicting themselves, right? It, <laughs> right? It's the problem. It's like, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. Yeah. Which we'll talk about contradictions, but yeah, exactly. Yeah. So remember with the not, it will change whatever comes after it. So if it's true, it'll change it to false. If it's false, it'll change it to true. So this is the complex statement, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, the two last ones that I'll cover. So these are the operators. These are the ones that change the values. So you look out when you're reading, you look out for if and then, not, or, and, that'll tell you. Now, categorical statements are a different animal. So I mentioned that, um, that you can do, that computers can do this stuff, like if and then, right? Like a robot. Mm -hmm. My robot does that. Like I have a, Roomba that cleans my floors. So if it hits a wall, then it turns around. Right. And it uses as well. Electronics use and. If you turn this, if you put this switch on and this switch on, then the whole thing turns on or something, right? Categorical statements, computers cannot quite do yet. Because categorical statements are much bigger statements. They're about categories. So when I say all EPC students are Facebook members, how many categories am I talking about in that sentence? Too much, I guess. I have two categories. What two categories am I talking about? What two groups am I talking about? EPCC, EPCC students and Facebook members? Right. And when I say... One category are Facebook members, part of the second category, right? Mm -hmm. Then that means that all the students, everybody in that category has to be a member of Facebook, right? For the sentence to be true. Right. But this is where the computers have problems. They can't really have a way to check all, all the time. Like this is where computers have problems. But do you understand? When you see the all, it's plural now because I'm not talking about one student anymore. Now I'm talking about all the students, right? The group of students right. and the Facebook members. Right. 
Now, if I say some students are Facebook members. True. But how many? What would be the lowest number of students that would have to be Facebook members for the whole thing to be true? What's the least amount? At least 50? At least one. If I say some uh, Facebook members, I only, I only need one person. Mm -hmm. But you see how this is where computers have a hard time. If you have an Alexa, you say, oh, Alexa, turn off some of the lights in the house. How does the computer know Which what, one? how many lights, right? Yeah. But if I tell a person, oh, turn off some of the lights in the house, what is the person going to do? Turn off the closest ones, I guess. They're going to make a decision, right? Because mm -hmm. we really think. Computers are not thinking. They're just following instructions, but they're not making decisions like the same way we're making decisions. Mm -hmm. This is why in logic, all in sum, computers are not quite there yet. They can do this stuff if it's very straightforward like one student, one Facebook member. If I start talking about groups and categories, then it gets a little difficult. So as humans, we're still better at this, at this point. But I'm saying in general, not all humans. <laughs> Some humans are not even that far. So, those are the operators. There are many more operators, and I gave you guys a link to a Wikipedia, which in this case I think is actually good. Gives you like all the different kinds of operators. You don't have to worry about every single operator out there. These are the main ones that you'll see in the book. These are the ones you should concentrate on. Now, see if you guys are gonna pay attention. What's the argument here? It says the number of abortions performed in this state is increasing and more and more women say that they favor greater access to abortion. What an outrage. What's the argument here? More and more women say that they favor greater access to abortion? No, they're stating, they're stating that, but they're not arguing for that. What are they arguing for? The number of abortions. No, they're stating that as well. The outreach. Outrage. But can they argue that it's an outrage? No. Why not? Think of that sentence. What an outrage. Could that be true or false? No. No. No, it's an opinion, right? Mm -hmm. So if it's an opinion, do they have a conclusion? No. no. So do they have an argument? No. No, there's no argument here. You see how tricky this is? This is what politicians do. They put out some facts, right? Maybe it's true it's increasing. Maybe it's true women favor greater. I said, they say, oh, what an outrage. I'm like, well, okay, but that doesn't prove anything. That's just your opinion. Right. See, there's no support for anything. There's, they're not proving anything. How I can change this into an argument and it's like, I need a conclusion that has a clear true or false, something that they can back up. So if they say, therefore, in this state, the trend among women is greater towards, that's something I can check. That's what surveys are about, right? Yeah. They give you a percentage about how many, but if you say, oh, well, I just don't like them. Well, okay, but that doesn't prove anything. So that's what I'm saying. Look for the conclusion. Look for the proof. If there's no conclusion, they don't have anything. Then. They don't have an argument. As my friend pointed out to somebody <laughs> one time, she was like, well, what's your conclusion? He's like, oh, I have a conclusion. I was like, well, I guess we're done. Because <laughs> I don't know where this is going. Like, it's, it's like you have some opinions, okay, but it doesn't prove anything. So that's why I'm saying, in this class, I'm looking for proof. 
How do you prove it? Not what you think about it. Now, statements and premises. I think there was a good explanation in, in the PDF about this. Premises are particular types of statements. They're the type of statements that are supporting the conclusion. So that's why I say they're the relevant facts. Not every fact out there is relevant to the case. So if you're looking for the premises, you're looking for, well, what's the relevant facts? So what are the premises in the argument here? If John killed Bill in self-defense, notice what, I, what we've been talking about right now. If and then, right? Mm -hmm. An operator. So that means that these two statements have to be together, right? Right. And notice too, is there another operator in that first sentence? Then. There's if and then, but if then, and then there's something else. Not. 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 So it's negating whatever factor, right? It's not murder. Mm -hmm. So I would translate this as if P, if it's self-defense, right? Mm -hmm. Then not what? Not Using murder. the variable. If P, then not Q, Q. Mm -hmm. right? Because we're going in the alphabet. Right. So it's not Q, so not murder. See how it changed that that's why not is important because it'll change it from murder right. to murder. So this first sentence is a, the first premise. The next statement, he did act in self-defense. That is the second premise, right? And then we have our conclusion. So we only have two premises in this argument: the first sentence and the second statement. So how do you know when it's a conclusion? There are some clues. Sometimes it will say therefore, so, thus. Those are clues that whatever comes after is a conclusion. If you see because, for, since, then, those are clues that it's the premise. But they don't always have to be there. You can have a conclusion without therefore. But these are just clues to help you. So I know it's going really long because I think it's already been an hour and 30, right? And there's a lot to cover. So what I can do, and I think this will work out best, is I'll continue here tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. All right. So in the meantime, once you guys look over what we covered, make sure you understand statements and premises, what an argument should look like, Remember, it should have a conclusion. You don't have right. a conclusion, you have no argument. Right. What are the operators? Does it have an and in there? Does it have an or, if, then, not, all, some? Keep those in mind because it'll change whether it's true or false. And don't forget the terminology. True, for true or false for statements valid or invalid for the structure of the whole argument. So we'll get to structures tomorrow. So like this argument example here, these statements are true or false, but the whole thing together, I'll show you how to tell whether it's a valid structure or invalid structure. So does it give you 100% or not for that conclusion? Then look over ahead of time. That's what I'm saying. The videos that I put. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> okay. So we talked about that we're going to use critical reasoning or critical thinking in order to evaluate more arguments. That's what this class is about. And we're going to use formal logic. And I said formal logic is normative. Don't forget this word normative. It is, means that it's based on an ideal standard of the way things ought to be. So logic, remember I said, is not about how, what, how people think, it's how they should think, how they should reason, not how they actually reason. Uh, the same thing with 
I would also say with um, ethics as well. So this course is about ethics. Ethics, you'll find out, is about what we should do, not what we actually do, right? Right. So both are very normative fields. I said mathematics as well. These are how things should be. There's very particular set rules about what it should be like. So I think this is a confusion uh, that a lot of students have when we start this course is that the other classes usually take, let's say like history or science, they're describing what's going on in the world. But that's not what we're doing here. We're saying this is how the world should be, how people should act, not how they're mm -hmm. acting right now. So, I mean, that's really relevant right now with what things are going on in the news, right? Mm -hmm. It's not how we're not describing. That's what sociology and psychology does. They describe what people are doing in the world, in society. But what we're talking about is, well, how we should conduct society, how we should do things. What's the right way to do things? So that's what I'm saying with logic, we're trying to say, well, how should people make a point or draw a conclusion, right? And this is why I said last time is going to be the tough part. We're going to use a formal language to do that with particular rules and structure, but you're going to have to translate. You have to learn to translate from a natural language like English or Spanish into a formal language with rules and structure, which I said also last time, that's, I think a hard thing for people to do like with word problems, right? How do you take something that a paragraph written in English and turn it into a formula to solve a problem, right? So we're essentially doing something like that. We're learning to solve ethical problems but we're going to have to translate the problem first to see how to figure out how to work it. Questions yet? So you can stop me at the time. Let me know if you need a clarification or you don't quite understand something. Okay. So we talked about arguments. Remember I said an argument is something that has a clear conclusion and you have statements that lead to that conclusion, that support it, that back it up. And even though we use the term argument for all sorts of different things, what we mean in this class is just that, that there's a conclusion and it's supported by statements. And I said, don't forget the terminology. Terminology is really important for us. Uh, this is why in philosophy, it, we're very technical about stuff because we're trying to be very particular about what we're saying. So I think this is especially a good example, like what's going on in the news right now, is that this is why maybe also I should stay away from the comment section on the internet. Um, <laughs> because people are not really evaluating or thinking about what they're saying. They're just expressing how they feel about something, but they're not really thinking about well, what, is, what do they mean when they say this or that, right? Right. And so, Right. So that this is why for philosophy, we try to be very technical and precise about what we're saying. So we'll, we mean what we say. So when I say a statement, when I'm talking about a statement and I'm trying to evaluate a statement and say, well, is this a good statement or not? What I mean by that is that, is this statement true or false? No. And then when I'm talking about the structure of an argument, this is a good argument structure or not i'm going to say if it's valid or invalid so if it's a valid structure then you're getting some guarantee about the solution if it's an invalid structure and you'll see today you're not guaranteed about the solution so perfect arguments are don't forget sound arguments where all the statements all the facts that you stated are true and the structure is valid. It's the right structure. That's the only time you get a sound argument. But they're very rare. I will admit that. Sound arguments are not common things. Uh, trying to give an example of a clear sound argument. A clear sound argument would be something like, um, 
all rectangles have four sides. This particular rectangle is four sided, therefore, right? So do you see how, is there any situation where you can find a rectangle that doesn't have four sides? No. You see how it's a sound argument? Right. That's why I was saying medieval philosophers had thought about this. Can God disprove a sound argument? And the answer is no. It's like, because God would have to have some sort of rectangle that doesn't have four sides. <laughs> How could that be, right? It's impossible. Right. <laughs> so when we get to the mathematics, kind of why it's similar to mathematics is that, because you'll find out that when you do mathematics, you actually, there's logic behind it too. So there's some serious discussion in philosophy about what's more fundamental, mathematics or logic? Like, what do you need first? And so there's a big debate about that. But it is pretty agreed on across the board that you need to work with both. So there's some deep logic inside mathematics. So when we talk about variables, right, I said there's values in the same way with mathematics. You talk about variables X and Y and Z, you get numerical values. Here you get truth values. There's a long history to that. And I think that's more for my logic class, but <laughs> all you need to know right now is that when we talk about a statement and how you know it's a statement or not is whether it's true or false. It can only have those two values. Okay. So we talked about the operators, right, as well. So like mathematics has operators, plus, minus, division. It tells you what to do with the values. It's going to change the solution. Same thing with logic. You have and, or, if, then, not, and the two categorical operators which I said computers have a hard time doing at this point, all and some. So pay attention to what I'm calling and what Avon calls indicator words. Technically, I think the real term is operators, but just to kind of follow along with what the PDF is saying, these words are words that you want to focus on because these are the words that are gonna operate on these statements, these values, right? And you'll see that in mathematics. Yeah. Definitely. You'll see if and then, or, and, all, some, all those terms, all those operators are used. That's why I said mathematics, the mathematics that you learn is actually mathematics mixed with logic, which is, that's why I feel it's unfortunate they don't teach you guys or they don't require everybody to take a logic course where i feel like if they did mathematics would make a lot more sense mm -hmm. so what was particular about these operators from last time sometimes they're not intuitive so be careful don't just trust your common sense and say well okay i'll figure it out on the spot remember the the case of if and then, right? I said, if you're a student, then you're a member of Blackboard. But what happens if you're not a student of BPCC, but then you're saying it's true that you're a member of Blackboard? What would the whole value be? That'd be false. False. True. The answer is true because oh. do you have to be a student EPCC to be a member of Blackboard? No. No. So the second part, see how it's broken into two parts? The second part is not always connected to the first part. That's why it's called a conditional statement. If this happens, then this will happen. It has a particular direction. This is unlike the and. The and doesn't have a direction. 
if this is true and this is true, well, then the whole thing is true, right? Right. One of them is false, then the whole thing is false for the and example. But if and then, you can draw to yourself like a little arrow. It has to go from the first part to the second part. There's a direction to it. This is the mistake that people make when they try to go from, you think about it also, I would say like cause and effect. This is the, the first part is the cause, the second part is the effect. But I can have the same effect, but a different cause, right? I can say, I'm a UTEP student, and then still have the same effect, right? That I'm a Blackboard member. Right. So that's the tricky part. The cause has, uh, I'm sorry, the effect has to be the same, but the cause can be different. So you have to go from the first part to the second part. You can't go backwards. This is where I'm saying people make a mistake. Like if I change it around, let's say I just used a different statement. So I said, if my cousin borrows my car, then the car is gonna be damaged. If I come home and I see my car is damaged, the second part, do I know for a fact that it's my cousin is the cause? No. No, right? But it could be, right? Yeah. Okay. You see how I can't go from the effect back to the cause for sure. But I can go from the cause to the effect. So that's the hard part to get over our psychology is that we jump to conclusions. We see the effect and we're like, oh, I know what the cause is, it's my cousin. That's the problem. So that's the hard part. You have to get, learn to get away from that sort of assumptions. This is why actually forensics is very difficult. And science is very difficult. To find evidence against somebody and say, oh, well, if they committed murder, right, then they must have been there. You, it's really hard because you can have the same evidence, right? And this is the case for a lot of people, but they weren't the person who was guilty of the crime. They arrested the wrong person. So this is why they're trying to trace it back from what they see to what happened before. And sometimes they make mistakes. They don't know 100%, sort of just because they have DNA evidence doesn't mean that is the person who committed the crime with 100% certainty. Still could be somebody else. There's a famous example, like if you take a biology course on genetics, there's a famous uh, lab that you have to do, and I'll give away the spoiler, is that you have a case where how can it be that you have DNA evidence that matches with a suspect, but they're not guilty of it, of the crime. So the kicker is they have an identical twin because you can have the same DNA evidence, right? Identical, right. but there it was their twin. So do you see how just because you have the DNA evidence doesn't guarantee you know exactly who did it? Mm -hmm. And then also with not, remember, it negates whatever comes after. So it changes the value. So if it's true that you're a student and I say not, you're not an EPC student, then the whole thing would be what? What's the value? True. False. False. Because I'm saying it's true that you're a student, but if I say not, you're not a student, Obviously, that is false, right? And I said, you could put two knots, right? You say, not, not a student. Then the whole thing would be what? True. True. So it's the same thing I do in programming, actually. In computer programming, which I'll teach my uh, class in summer two with logic, same thing we do with computers. If I wanted to turn 
off, I put a knot in front of it if it's on, right? And then if I wanted to turn it back on, I put another knot in front of it and it'll flip it back on. Same thing how computers work is what we're doing here. And then categorical statements, remember they're very difficult because this is what I said computers can't do, all and some. And we're talking about categories, we're talking about groups. So we're not talking about individuals. This is plural, not singular. So we're talking about large groups. Now remember for some, how many, how many individuals do you need? How many students do you need in order for this whole statement to be true? One. Just one. one. Right? We usually clarify in English some one, right? We say that. But technically, if I just say some students are Facebook members, I only need one person. Right. At the very least. So it's very counterintuitive, but that is how we work logic. And I said, what was the problem with this example here? That we don't have a conclusion. Right, because it's an opinion. And mm -hmm. do we have an argument then? No. Nope. No. So we need a clear conclusion to have an argument. Right. That's why I say evaluate, look at what's going on. If there is no conclusion, they have no argument. So I would say one of the first things you should do is identify when you're reading something, what's the conclusion here? Mm -hmm. Trying to prove. If you can't identify a clear conclusion, you may not have an actual argument, argument going on. And the premises, remember, are particular type of statements. They're the relevant statements. They're the supporting statements. You can think about it like the, re the relevant evidence. Because not any fact out there is always relevant. This happens a lot in, in court cases as well. Um, because both sides will try to argue which facts are relevant and which are not, right? So what they're really arguing about is what are the premises and what are just regular statements. So because the guy had a red shirt on, is that relevant to the case or not is what they're going to argue about. Is that a real premise to the argument or not? If it's irrelevant, maybe it's true he had a red shirt on, but it has nothing to do with the case, then it's like it's not a premise. And remember words, these are indicator words, these are clues to tell you what are conclusions and which are premises. So of course I have the PowerPoint up here um, for you to download. You don't have to memorize them all, but there is a list there and there's in the PDF as well to remind you, is this a conclusion? Is this a premise? How can I tell? Now this is where the new stuff we're getting into today. We talked about the statements, they're true or false, how the operators connect them. But now we get to the structure. How do you build the entire house? How do you put it all together? This is, I think, the harder part. So there, I'm gonna talk about two main type of structures for arguments. They're not the only ones out there, but I would say that they're probably the most relevant that you're gonna work with. Deductive structures and inductive structures. So a deductive structure is gonna to attempt to give you conclusive support for a conclusion. Inductive structures on the other hand, give you probable support. 
Another way to think about this is that deductive structures are attempting to give you a hundred percent certainty about that conclusion. Like there's no mistake about it. Inductive structures can't give you a hundred percent. They can only give you a probability, like 90%, 80% that that's the solution. So where would you see deductive structures used? Where what sort of fields or classes where you use deductive structures? True premises. But what kind of like I'm saying like what class would you have to take that would completely make you use deductive structures where you have conclusive support, hundred percent certainty? Uh huh. Huh? Law? A law degree? I wish. <laughs> but this is but this is good. No, I think this is a good point. This is, I think Maybe like oh. biology? No, no. Biology is terrible at that. Um, oh. no, 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 no. So the mathematics is the main one because of mathematics you're guaranteed that that's the solution if you did it correctly, right? How do you prove the answer? You have a, if you did it correctly, you have a hundred percent certainty. This is how it works, right? Let me address law first though. Law is difficult because law attempts to use some deductive structures, right? But in order to back up the argument, let's go back to that example that I used. If John killed Bill in self-defense, then he did not commit murder. He did act in self-defense and he did not commit murder. This is attempting to be a deductive structure, but do we, how are we going to know if John acted in self-defense? What evidence can we provide to say it's self-defense and it's not murder? Like imagine a real court case. What would they try to show? What kind of evidence would they try to bring to the case? Maybe a weapon on the other person's. Good. But then now we have to remember what I said. Do we know just because somebody owned that weapon that it was the person, the owner, that was responsible for the death? Yeah. Right. See the problem. Maybe yes. Um, maybe uh, someone to testify that see the uh... right, which is also very sketchy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Eyewitness identification is terrible. Mm -hmm. Plenty of psychology out there, <laughs> like studies that will back this up. They're supportive of like we swear it was a guy. I saw him and. They're not lying. They're very sincere. Like, I swear it was that guy. And then you see the videotape and it's like totally somebody else different. Mm -hmm. Like, human beings are terrible at eyewitnesses. Like, if you're ever in a situation where you have to go to court and they're going to try to bring an eyewitness, I would tell your lawyer right away because they would know. Right. Eyewitness identification is not a really good, reliable source of evidence. So that's the issue about law. And there's some really good philosophers that I admire that are working on this, is that how do you prove that somebody's 100% guilty when your proof relies on stuff that may be true? Mm -hmm. This is why we're never certain 100% that the person who's arrested or convicted of a crime is the actual person who did the crime. This is why a lot of innocent people are in jail. So, deductive structures, not law. Biology, no. Actually, biology would be in the realm of inductive structures. This is why in biology, you can only give statistical percentages. You can never give certainty. And this is something that I that I emphasize here because uh, my area of study, my expertise is philosophy of science. 
science can never prove anything to be 100% true. Science does not have that power. This is why you have to buy new science textbooks every couple of years. Because science is relying on theories and hypotheses. But you can never give 100% certainty for any theory or hypothesis. It's always some probable support. This is why uh, in any medical or scientific uh, textbook, whatever they're telling you is the best evidence we have right now. But that doesn't mean that we're not going to find some other evidence that's going to contradict it and we're going to have to change it. I mean, if you really want to laugh, get a science textbook from like 30 years ago and you'll find all these things that they've found out aren't, aren't true. So science doesn't prove anything to be 100% certain. It only works in probabilities. This is, other example would be like, go to CVS, you see in the aisles, home pregnancy test. The box says 99.9% .9 accurate, 99.8%. Why doesn't it just say 100? Pretty close. Why can't they just put 100% on the box? Because there could be false positives or false negatives. Exactly. Do you see how like science and anything that's related to science is, doesn't give you certainty? Mm -hmm. So they're, they're using actually inductive structures. Science is inductive. Mathematics is deductive. But they're good structures, I would say. They're, they're both very useful, though. Just because you don't get 100% doesn't mean, you know, especially right now, right? Other things that have like 99 or 98% is like stuff like I have with me right now is like antibacterial, like, right? It can't say 100% that it's going to kill all the germs. But that doesn't mean you, don't, you shouldn't use it. Especially right now, you should be washing your hands. Doesn't, but this is the mistake I think going on with the virus right now. People are thinking, well, I just washed my hands. I just disinfected. I'm sure I'm safe. It's like, well, there's always a percentage. There's always a chance, right? You can mm -hmm. take all the precautions. You can take, put on your mask. Everything doesn't mean you're 100% safe ever. So we're always working in a situation where it's a probability. We're trying to reduce the probability. Washing your hands, disinfected, mask, they cut down the probability you're gonna be infected, but it doesn't make it 100%. Now what both structures are really good at though, even though they're really different from each other, is that they help you avoid contradictions. Now a contradiction is something very particular in logic. What we mean by a contradiction is that when you state something is true and then at the same time you claim that it's false. That would be a contradiction. So let me exit out of the, the, the view real quick and see if I can show you what I mean. Let me go to that slide. Where are we? There we go. So if I were to make a contradiction in a technical sense, I would say, remember the variables, right? P could sound for some statement, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How would I contradict that statement? What's the opposite of P? Say P and what would the opposite of P be? Not P. Not P. That's the correct, because some students have said, oh, P, well, the opposite of P is P and Q. It's like, well, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Q is different, but it doesn't mean it's the opposite. Right. So this is really important. 
why we don't want contradictions like this, why you don't want to say P and not P, is because then you're going to say it's true, right? Let's say you're a student, right, is what we've been using as an example. So it's true that you're a student and what? Not P. What would not P be? Not a student. Not a student. Which is, what's another way of saying not a student? The sentence would be what? The statement would be what? What's the value? True or false? False. 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 And I said, if it's true, it's false, then the whole thing is what? False. False. Because both sides have to be true, right? Right. So then the whole thing is false. This is why you don't want contradictions in your arguments. Because essentially you're saying it's true and it's false at the same time. And how can that be? How can you be, a, it's true that you're a student and it's true that you're not a student, which is false. You see how it's always gonna come out as false? Mm -hmm. So no matter what you say, whatever goes in those variables, P, it's always gonna come out false by default. Be careful, because I've had students do this for me in class. They'll say that, oh, well, abortion is, is wrong and then later, and it's not wrong. In the same paragraph, I'm like, wait, what? Mm -hmm. it's wrong, and then in the next sentence you say, oh, it's not wrong. I'm like, how does <laughs> But people contradict themselves, right? This is what I say, be careful. Remember, it's not about how we think, it's how we should think. People contradict themselves very regularly. We say something and then the next minute we say the opposite. So it's not about how we think, it's how we should think. So let me go back to the view real quick. So don't forget that contradictions are always false. Never want a contradiction in your argument because essentially it's like you just shot yourself in the foot, like you disproved yourself. And I've had students disprove themselves. It's not pretty. <laughs> now let's talk about the deductive structures first. I think I start with deductive structures because they're easier to work with. They're very straightforward. Now, there's three valid forms that are very common in the book. They're not the only valid forms. There's perhaps an infinite number, I'm not sure, but that's a deep philosophical question. But I show these three forms because these are just the ones you're gonna see most likely. Affirming the antecedent, which in uh, Latin, because these are very old structures, modus ponens, uh, denying the consequent, in Latin is modus tollens and what we call a hypothetical syllogism. Those are valid structure forms. Those are valid structures that you can use. Now there's two forms that are very common that are invalid and I don't want you to use. The nine antecedent and affirming the consequent. These are bad news. But be careful because they start to sound very similar to the first two, right? So let's go back to one. If I say I'm affirming the antecedent, what does that mean? In other words, what, what do they say when it's affirming the antecedent? That P is true. What is true? P, I mean the first uh, statement. What statement? No. What's an antecedent? Let's start there. What's an antecedent? Uh, 
What does antecedent mean? Doesn't it mean like uh, the thing that was said before, like the first thing? Correct. So I'm affirming, I'm saying what was stated before is affirming is true, right? And if I'm denying the consequent, what am I saying? Can you repeat that? If I'm saying I'm denying the consequent, what's another way of saying denying the consequent? Uh, you're saying that the last thing that you said or the last conclusion that you said was wrong? Right, it's false. Uh -huh. So that's what the word is. Affirming the antecedent, I'm saying what came before, the antecedent is true. The consequent, what came after, is false. So notice the two invalid forms. It says denying the antecedent. The antecedent is saying, I'm saying what came before is false. And the second one, affirming the consequent, I'm saying what came after is true. They look similar, but they're saying different things. This is why I want you to be careful about it and understand. Don't try to memorize. Actually, that's another general lesson from psychology. Do not rely on your memory. Your memory is just as bad as your eyewitness. Maybe that's in part why your eyewitness identification is so bad. People rely on memory. Memory is a terrible thing to rely on. Do not rely on your memory. I highly suggest you understand what the words mean, what the terms mean. Don't try to memorize stuff. It's not gonna be really that effective in the long run. And then hypothetical syllogism. Uh, syllogism a syllogism is an argument that has three elements and there's a hypothetical part in it. Remember hypothetical is an if then, so there's gonna be an if then in there. So we'll go through ex examples of each one. And you'll, you'll see what I mean. So the first one, modus ponens, the structure is this. If P then Q, the second premise says P, and that line right there, just like in math, that tells you that's whatever comes after is the solution, right? So the way we read that is we'll just say some indicator word like therefore or so. So if P then Q, P is true, therefore Q is true. So the example that my old instructor would use all the time, he would say, well, okay, let's um, exchange, let's put in place for P, it rained. And then for Q, the streets outside are wet. So I would read it as, if it rained, P, then Q, the streets are wet. Does everybody follow along so far? Mm -hmm. So then what would two say? Going with our example. It rained. It rained. And then therefore, what's the conclusion? Three. The streets are wet. The streets are wet. Do you see, good, so do you see how if one is true, if two is true, three is what? True, it has to be true because of the structure. If it rained, then the streets are wet. It rained, therefore the streets are wet. If I know it, one is true and two is true, do I have to get up? and go outside to see if three is true. No, because the structure ensures that three must be true if one and two are true. Right. So these are the structures I was saying that you use in mathematics, but you guys don't realize it. that all the statements have to be there. This is also maybe a difference. This is why I kind of like teaching logic because, uh, and this is why my criticism of a lot of math teachers, 
<laughs> like the fact that since they've been doing math so long, they kind of assume that people know what they know. Mm-hmm. So they don't show all their work or you're like really confused. Like, wait, how do they get there? Cause they can do a lot of these steps in their head. But for logic, we're required. I remember my old teacher, we had to do every single step. We have to show every single step in our work because that guarantees that's the solution. So for the example here, even though I'm just restating P, the same P again, I, I need it there in order to show I'm going to get Q next. So it's just showing all my work. So to have this structure, everything that's up there has to be there. You can't skip any steps. Now the second structure, if P then Q, not Q, therefore not P. So let's go back to the rain example. If it rains then the streets are wet, and then what would two say using our rain example? It isn't raining. No. What, what was Q? The streets are not wet. The streets are not wet. Because remember, if it rains, P, P is rain. Q is the streets are wet. So if I say not Q, the streets are not wet. And then what do we know for three then? What does three say? It did not rain. It did not rain. So you see how I'm guaranteed about three. If it rains and the streets are wet and the streets are not wet, rain. then it didn't rain. Now we're going to pick it up another step. Hypothetical syllogism. If P then Q, if Q then R, therefore if P then R. So let's go back to our rain example here. If it rains, then the streets are wet. That's number one. What does two say then? If the streets are wet, then, and then a different variable? Right, it's a different variable, R. So we didn't establish what that variable is, right? What would right. make sense in this scenario? What would R be? What was the question? What would R be then? What would make sense in this scenario? So we didn't establish what statement R is. So what, what kind of statement can we put in R? Then the roads would be slick. Right, good. So then, starting from one, if it rains and the streets are wet, if the streets are wet, that's Q, right? Then the roads are slick, R. So what do we know in the end? What's three? Therefore, if it rains, then the roads are slick? Right. So do you see how we can get three? We know three is true if one and two are true. Mm -hmm. This is what I said about showing our work. How do I connect P to R? I have to show that P connects to Q and Q connects to R. And then this is why I was saying math, mathematicians are kind of sometimes bad at teaching because they can do this in their head and they're all like, oh, P then R. And you're like, what? How do you get there? I didn't get these steps. But for logic, we have to show all our work. We have to show every single step exactly how we got to R. So when we're, arg we're, we're developing arguments, and this is why I'm teaching you all this for ethics. In ethics about right or wrong and who's guilty and who's not, you're going to have to show, well, wait a minute, how does it all connect? You can't just jump to the assumption, oh, well, obviously they're wrong. It's like, well, wait a minute, where's the proof? How did you get to that conclusion that they're wrong? 
So that's going to be the tough part, I think, of the class is how are you going to back it up? How are you going to show every single step to where you can prove? This is why a lot of the good philosophers you're going to read uh, throughout the semester, they're really good at this. They really thought this out and they want to support, like, how did they get to that conclusion? They're going to show every single step of their work. Now, the two invalid forms, the ones I don't want you to do, these are the ones that are not going to give you 100% certainty about the conclusion. But they look really similar to the ones that we just saw. Affirming the consequent. So if P then Q, Q is true, therefore P is true. So if we're using the rain example, if it rained and the streets are wet, what does Q say? The streets are wet. The streets are wet. And what are they trying to say in the, in the conclusion then? What do they know? Therefore, it's rain. Right. Is there a problem with that? Do they know that for sure? No. No. Because no. there could have been another explanation, right? Just because mm -hmm. I look outside and I see the streets are wet doesn't mean it, did, it was the rain, right? There could be another explanation. There's a fire hydrant leak. Somebody left the get on. I don't know. But it was something else, right? This is what, remember, you can't go to the cause from the effect. They're trying to go backwards. Oh, I saw the effect, so I know the cause. But they don't know that for certain. Question. Any questions? No. Okay. Another silly example that I have here too is if I'm a human, then I'm a mammal. I'm a mammal. Well, therefore, I must be human. Mm. <clears throat> you see how that doesn't work either? No. So just because it's a mammal, do you know it's going to be a human? No. No. See how you can go from one to the other because the order matters that's why I said the order matters um, the 90 antecedent is a version of this too if P then is true then Q is true P is false so you're denying the antecedent you're saying whatever came before well that's not true therefore what's going to come after the, the consequent Q is can't be true either so if we read it with the rain example, if it's raining, then the streets are wet. It isn't raining, right? Not P. Therefore, the streets aren't going to be wet. But do we see the problem here again? Yeah. Something else can cause the streets to be wet, right? Not just the rain. So I said, same effect, but you could have different causes. This is actually how you test for, um, this is hypothesis testing actually, really. Uh, like say for medications, this is basically what you do. It's like, it could be the medication that got the patient better, or it could be something else. See how you're never 100% certain it's the medication that you gave them is what made them better? There's always a question mark of, well, this is why it's a probability. It could be, or we're pretty sure it's the medication. So that's why if anybody is in the nursing program here, this is what's going to make your life difficult, is that you're never 100% certain. So there's some practice problems that I was posted up here just to make sure everybody's on the same page and everybody understands what we've been talking about. And these two concepts, I really want to make sure that you understand the difference between these two concepts. Validity and soundness. Remember, validity is about the structure. Soundness is more complicated than that. So when we talk about the structure, can a valid argument have true premises and a false conclusion? 
what would the answer be? Yes or no? Can a valid no. have true premises and a false conclusion? No. no. Why? Because both has to be true. No. No? No, 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 no. Remember with the structure. If the premises are true, can I get a wrong answer? If it's a valid structure, can I get a false conclusion? No, remember that if it rains, then the streets are wet. It rained, therefore, the streets are wet. It has to be three, right? Three has to be true. The last one has to be true because they saw one and two. If it's a valid structure, it's, this is the hard part, I think, for a lot of students. It's the structure that's doing the work here, it's not the statements themselves. It's the structure that it has that particular flow that's getting you to that particular answer. So can a valid argument have false premises and a true conclusion? Yes or no? I say no. Yes. Yes. How could that be? How can you have a valid argument, have false premises, but you get a true conclusion? Because your conclusion might be true, but the supporting evidence does whatever, the premises is not supporting it. Even though it's true. Right. So maybe they are guilty is your conclusion, but how you got there, mm -hmm. it doesn't really support that. You just happen to be right. Mm -hmm. So, what I also want to emphasize, remember, they're just variables. When I say if, P, and Q, they're just placeholders, they're just variables. Any statement can go in there. Doesn't mean that necessarily you know it's going to be true. But the structure is going to stay the same. So, going back real quick, see, the structure doesn't change. It's just what I put in the variables changes. See my examples on the bottom here? Mammals, humans, rain, streets. I didn't change the structure, I'm just changing the variables. So you can think about these structures kind of like formulas. This is what you do with formulas, right? A squared plus B squared equals C squared. It's not about what numbers you put in there. It's, it has the right structure. And then you plug in the numbers, the variables. Same thing here. Has the right structure, but you put in the variables. Now, can a valid argument have false premises and a false conclusion? Can everything be false in a valid structure? Is it possible? Uh, yes. Why? Why? Yeah. Um, because you can say something that is false and then come to the conclu conclusion of something that's false. And you, you could just be wrong altogether. Right. You can have a valid structure do that. So let's go back to a structure that was valid, right? Remember modus ponens. So if I say something that's completely false, right? That we know is going to be false for number one. So let's say if there's unicorns outside, that's P, right? Please tell me you know that's false, right? If there's unicorns outside. We are agree right. with that, yes. right? Yeah, that's false. Unicorns outside, then they shit Skittles. <laughs> so the whole thing is false, right? Right. Okay. What would two say? So the structure is valid, but the argument is false. Right. right. So if we use me my unicorn example, what would two say? What would P be? That there were unicorns outside? Yeah, exactly. So let's read it again from one. 
if there's unicorns outside, then we should Skittles. Two says there are unicorns outside. Therefore, what's the conclusion? What's Q? That is just Skittles. Skittles. Right. So did I mess with the structure in any way? No. No, but everything I said was false, right? Right. So it's still a valid structure, but all the statements are false. So it's valid, but it's not sound. Right. Good. Exactly. So you can have a valid structure, but it doesn't mean it's a sound argument. So I think this is a thing with like in law, this is an issue that they do have to deal with is that they can have a valid structure. Maybe they're using modus ponens to argue their case, but all their evidence is false. So remember validity is different from soundness because just because it's valid doesn't mean it's sound. So can an invalid argument have a true conclusion? Yeah. No. Let's go back to an invalid argument. So both of these are examples of an invalid argument. Can the conclusion be true? Yes. Yes, because this is, notice what I say here, affirming the consequent. If it rains and the streets are wet, right? We said that, but remember they're just variables. Right. I can exchange it for, what would be something that's true? What would we know is true that we could put for P? Name any fact that's true. Um, you gotta make it harder than it is. It, it just hit, <laughs> it's true. It doesn't matter. Just it doesn't grass is green. Okay, grass is green. So if grass is green then you're going to get an A, which is false, right? Right. Two says what? You're going to get an A. Hopefully it's true, but you know, I'm just saying, for this example, false. <laughs> but does, is three true then? With our example? No. Grass is not green? Grass is green. Grass is green. Do you see how the conclusion is true, even if it's an invalid structure? So this is the hard part. You have to separate the truth from the structure. I think this is the hard part for all, a lot of students. These are like formulas, but the formula is not the same thing as the numbers you put into it. They're good when they work together, but one is not going to guarantee the other. You can have the right formula and put in the wrong numbers. You can have the right numbers and have the wrong formula. So I'm saying don't rely that or don't assume that one's going to guarantee the other. And so validity is about the structure and soundness is about the statements being true and the structure being valid. Remember sound arguments, the perfect arguments, they have to have those two conditions. Validity just has to have the right structure, it has to be the right formula, but it doesn't tell you those are the right uh, values that you're putting into the variables. So to tell you the truth, computers really can only do 
structures. Computers can't give you the truth. <laughs> so computers, this is why they're good at following directions because they're giving them the structure. Ball, do this, do this, do this. But they can't tell you, oh, that's the right thing to do. Like computers don't have the ability to, to, to determine what is actually true and what's not. And contradictions are always what? We just said this before. What are what do you know if it's a contradiction? Because you're saying you're you're um, you say the statement and then you second guess it, like not second guess it, but you're saying it's true and then what are you saying later? But then not true. It's false. It's false. And the whole thing would be what? False. False. So contradictions are always false. This is why you never want to use contradictions in your arguments. You're always going to come out with a false result. And is logic about how we actually reason? No. No. Because you'll see why <laughs> in this class why that's usually false. Any questions? If you guys want to go back to anything, slow down or anything. Can I go back to the uh, before presentation? Which one? Uh, this one. Is soundness one distinct? Are true and the structure is valid. Okay. okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I have a little problem for you guys to work on right now. Okay. I have two arguments. And what you're going to do is you're going to tell me which argument is valid and which argument is invalid. So argument A says, the first premise says all Mexicans are illegal. The second premise says my grandma's Mexican, therefore my grandma's illegal. Spoiler, it has nothing to do with my grandma. Don't get caught up on the words. What are we talking about when we talk about validity? What did I say is we're talking about? Structure. Structure. So get away from the words. I chose this example on purpose because people get caught up in the words and they can't see the structure. Now the second argument says, argument B, all Mexicans are illegal, my grandma's illegal, therefore my grandma's Mexican. So which of the two arguments is valid and which of the two arguments is invalid? A is valid and B is invalid. Why? Because she can be illegal, but she doesn't have to be Mexican. Right. So do you see how the structure is separate from the words? Yes. Think about it for a second for those who, who are having trouble seeing it. If we take away the words and we just look at the structure, what's the first operator we see? All. All. So all tells you what? What do we say? Everyone. So categories. Well, all Mexicans. How many categories do we have? Illegal and Mexican. Right. So there's two categories. Mm -hmm. Now, for those who, this is what I say, take away the the words, all P's or Q's are my grandma, right? Because it's right. C, it's not a group, right? Mm -hmm. R is what? Is a P, right? That's what it's saying. Is Mexican, right? That's the first group, right? So R belongs to P. 
So then what do you know? What's the conclusion? And my grandma is illegal. R is a Q, right? Because we said all P's are Q's. Oh, but if you do the other one, all P's are Q's, R is a Q, therefore R is a P. What's wrong with that? Why can't I say R is P if I know R is Q? We don't know if the grandma is Mexican. Right, just because she belongs to the second category, illegal, right? Right. So, so you are affirming the consequence. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So then if you're, I, I know some people are visual learners. Mm-hmm. Remember Venn diagrams? Uh-huh. They're really helpful right now. So the first argument, if we use Venn diagrams to represent the first argument, we have those two categories, right? Right. That's all P's are Q's. All Mexicans are illegal, right? And then we said, what was the second premise for the first argument? Argument A. My grandma is Mexican. So she would go where? In the diagram. In the small, in the inner circle. Right. And if she's in the inner circle, what do we know? That means she's illegal. Right. She has to belong to the bigger circle. Right. But if we went the other way with the argument, do you see all my yeah. It starts the same way, right? Uh -huh. But it says she's illegal. She's in this circle. Does that mean we know she's in the smaller circle? No. Yeah. No, she could be something else, right? Right. So you see, it's about the structure. It's not about the statements. One's going to get you the answer. The other one's not going to give you the answer for certainty. This one is a certain answer. This one's not a certain answer. Now, I'm picking on my grandma, but it does not have anything to do with, with my grandma, right? So to understand why one argument structure works and why one doesn't has nothing to do with what goes inside the variables. It's just figuring out which has the right structure. And this is the hard part to get through with our psychology is that when we read something like this, we get caught up on the words and we're like, well, wait a minute, who's Mexican? Who's illegal? What grandma? And we can't get away from that and see, well, behind it, what's the structure? We go based on emotion. Yeah. Instead of facts. Right. So, I mean, I, I use this example because I don't know, it's like something Trump would say, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, because, I mean, let, well, on that point, can either of these arguments ever be sound? No. Why not? Because, I mean, not all Mexicans are illegal and not all illegals are Mexican. Even deeper than that, this is real philosophy. If you look at the first premise, all Mexicans are illegal, that will, will that ever be true? No. Why not? Not all of them are. But will it ever be true? In the history of the universe, will that ever be true? Well, if they're born in Mexico. But I'm saying like 2,000 years from now, whatever. Will that ever be true? No, it will always be false because illegal is not a property of people. So this is a deep logical thing. So all my students, I'm talking about the subject 
there's a subject and the, the and a predicate. You guys know what a predicate is? So a predicate is some property of an object, right? Mm -hmm. So the object here is Mexicans, and the property, the predicate is illegal. But illegal is not something a property. It's not a property that people can have. So people can be tall. That's a property, right? People can weigh a certain weight. That's a property. They have a certain mass. But they can't possess the property of being illegal. This is why I can't look at somebody. I can look at somebody and see if they're tall, right? But I can't look at a person and see if they're illegal. It's not a property that they have. But we talk about it as if it is. This is a mistake that we make. We think we can tell from using our eyes whether somebody has legal status or not, which is incorrect. Because illegal is not a property of a person. It's not something they have. So these arguments will never be false. I'm sorry, sound. Because the first premise will always be false. Questions before I go on? No. Sir? So to remember, and these are more formal uh, representations if we're really strict about Venn diagram rules. So you see how one guarantees and the other one doesn't. Now, so don't forget soundness, the premises have to be true and the structure has to be valid. Only time you can have a sound argument, no other time. Both conditions have to be met. So that, I think I promised you guys last time, but that will definitely be on the quiz. You should know that. When do you have a sound argument? Because you can have a valid argument, but it doesn't have to be sound. So going back to my analogy, this is what I'm saying. It's like a sound argument is like having, having the perfect house. All the materials you bought for the house are perfect, the wood, the concrete, and it has the right design. Then it'll hold up. Now, inductive logic, this is the second type of structure. Inductive logic, I said, is going to give you probable support, right? That means that if you have an inductive argument, the conclusion is false, even if the premises are true. It's a possibility. Example here, let's say we took a survey and we asked 40 students at random, right? Different subjects, different levels, what they thought about tuition. And say, would they be okay with tuition going up? And let's say 32 of the 40 said, yeah, they're okay with tuition going up. Can I say that all the students feel the same way? Or no. more students feel the same way? No. Maybe. You could say multiple, but not all. Right. right. So if I say most, that's like saying some, right? Right. So this is the thing. Three can be true or it could be false if all you know is one and two. This is what Ian Hacking, he's a really famous philosopher in Toronto, he calls risky arguments. This is why inductive logic can give you 100%. Just because even if you have the right facts, one and two, let's imagine that it's really true, doesn't guarantee you three. And why I said your science textbooks have to change every couple of years. It's like a hypothesis. Just because the evidence what we have 
seems to point in a certain way doesn't mean it's absolutely true. Right. Also another field, or if you want to call it a field, where, where else do you see inductive logic or inductive structures used besides science? In more general, outside of school, like where would you see people use inductive arguments? No one gambles, or no anybody, <laughs> no anybody who gambles. Aren't they risky arguments, right? So this really happened. This is a side, but this really happened where a professor, right? I don't know if anybody's heard this story at MIT. Was teaching students in a probability course how to beat Vegas, and he took them to Vegas. And they got a lot of money, and they want, and then they started turning to each other, and then they got arrested. <laughs> like, I don't, I'm not taking you guys to Vegas. But what he was essentially teaching them is inductive reasoning, because when you're playing cards or something, you're counting cards or whatever, you're working with probabilities. You're saying, okay, I've seen three aces. And I know there are four aces in the deck, right? So what's the chances I'm going to get an ace? Like that type of reasoning is essentially inductive reasoning. So you're betting. You're, these are all risks. You're betting on what are the chances. Insurance, stock markets, they all work with inductive reasoning. So it's really powerful, even though it doesn't give you 100%, it's really powerful and used in a lot of different situations. Most common uh, indicator words that tell you if it's an inductive argument or not, probably, likely, in all probability, chances are, these are good words to help you know if, oh, this is an inductive argument. This is where there's, this could be risky. We don't know 100% about the conclusion from the information we have. And then I just like John Oliver. So be careful about inductive arguments. They're risky arguments, but they could be good arguments. That's why I said with, just because the, the soap doesn't kill 100% of the germs doesn't mean stop washing your hands. It's like, please do. Now, the three type of structures that you'll see with inductive arguments a lot is a sample to a population, a population to a sample, and a sample to a new sample. So Vaughn doesn't talk about this, but this is why I included, uh, I'm working, I brought this from Ian Hacking, because uh, I think he's, he wrote a really good book about inductive reasoning and logic. Um, these are the type of structures you'll see in science very often. Because you can't, let's say you're testing a drug. Can you test the drug on everybody, the entire population in the country? No, no, right? You have to work from a sample. And then you generalize to the population. So going through the first one, let's imagine that we're biologists, let's say. We can't test all the frogs in the forest. But I say, well, if I pick up four frogs completely at random, and they're green, can I say all the frogs in the forest are green? So if one is true, can I say two is true? No. Maybe. Maybe. Because we haven't seen another colored frog yet, right? This is, this is what I was saying about the textbooks. The information that they're putting in the textbooks is that they're saying, well, this is what we've seen so far. We haven't seen anything different yet. So in medical textbooks, scientific textbooks, this is what they're going with. Their conclusion is the hypothesis. They're saying, this is the best hypothesis or theory that we have right now, because we haven't seen anything that contradicts it yet. 
but doesn't mean it won't later. That some evidence later will say, oh, well, you know what? We found a different color frog. This is actually a real life case when people would say all swans are white. This is a really famous philosophy case. All swans are white. But is that true, that all swans are white? No. Where do they have different color swans than white? Repeat. Where? Australia. In Australia, they have black swans. Their natural swans are black. But you see the problem here. If I said, okay, we're gonna look at all the swans and tell me what color, we're gonna report what color they are, but we're not gonna go to Australia because it's too far away. Do you see how there's always a chance just because we see all these white swans that we could still be wrong about all the swans being white? No, no, that's fine. You can, we need background music, apparently. I'm fine. Um, <laughs> but do you see where I'm going with this? Is like, it's it's always a chance, right? But this is what we really do with medication and everything like that. I can't test all the people who have this condition, but I'm going to have to get a sample, right? Right. So this is where we get to some deep medical ethics as well. These are. A real life example about this is that, do you know how they got, you know how they have warning labels on medication? Like some of the yes. bottles say may cause birth defects. Yes. Do you know how they found that out? Some kids came out with birth defects. But they, you would think they would have tested the drug, right? Both. Right. So what had happened, and especially if you, I mean, you can Google this, you can look it up the history, but what happened is that prior to the 1960s, they would test these drugs out on, on the samples, right? But the samples they got were all men. They say, well, nothing bad happened to them, this sample, so I'm sure this drug is okay. And they didn't think about testing it on women until later they're like, oh, it caused birth defects and some women had a birth defect. Now, now we're going to put a label on it. But do you see how like there's very poor ethics here, right? Is that they're not thinking about what the population really is representative of it. They're very biased and it does have serious consequences. Now, the second structure is population to sample. You can go the other way. You can go from saying something about the entire population and then we want to say something about that sample. So all or almost all the frogs in the forest are green. Therefore, if you go out there and you pick up four at random, I bet you they're going to be green too. That could be true, right? Mm -hmm. But of course, it's not 100% certain based on the structure. This is also what happens with stereotyping, if you notice. Because think about stereotyping. We say, well, all or almost all those people are like that. So that person is going to be the same way. Do you see how, like, is a big risk here and it's a form of stereotyping? So this is the hard part. This is why inductive logic, I think, is really important. And then the last one is sample to new sample. That's when you take one sample and then say, well, if it's true for this sample, then it's true for the next sample. That's not the entire population. You're saying that in this case, if it's true for these four frogs, then the next four frogs, it should be true for them too. The same thing we work with... Uh, in medic and the pharmaceutical industry, I think they rely on this a lot for advertising. This is where the advertising comes in. If it worked for these four people, then it's gonna work for the next four people, right? Mm -hmm. So
So you can never have a sound inductive argument because the structure is always invalid. But that doesn't mean you can have you can't have a good inductive argument. We would call a good inductive argument a cogent argument. Instead of sound, we say it's cogent because at least the premises are true. Maybe we can't be 100% certain about the structure, but the data or information that we're working with, we can make sure that's true. So that's what good science is about, is cogent arguments, making sure that the data you're working with is as accurate as possible, even though you're not 100% certain about your hypothesis or theory. Now, there are plenty of real life cases, of course, of scientists using arguments that are not cogent, that are falsifying data. So there's plenty of cases of that of where uh, some scientists who are very corrupt have falsified or made up their data to get a drug passed. This is why you have those lawyers on TV, right? Saying, hey, have you taken this medication? Do you deserve like, you know, some compensation for this? Like, why? Because, it's, because the, the, the company that developed the drug, in some cases, they knew it had bad side effects, but they weren't going to tell anybody about it, right? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I think this is the case is that they're doing a cost benefit analysis. They figured out that even if people sue them and all this bad stuff happens, they'll still make more money selling the drug. So they would rather sell the drug, falsify, make up their data. And even if they have to pay lawyers, fees, all this stuff, they'll still make more money in the end, even if they hurt people in the process. which I think is, uh, yeah, there, there are plenty of cases like that, unfortunately. So I have another little like question for you guys. It's another little like problem to work on. Now we're talking about probable statements, right? Inductive statements. So I have four answer choices up here on the right hand side. Sochi's a bank teller, Sochi's an active feminist, Sochi's a bank teller and active feminist, Sochi's a bank teller and active feminist who takes yoga classes. This is what I want you to do. I want you to rank them in order from most probable to least probable. So number one, of the four choices, what's most likely to what's least likely? E would be number one, I think. Yeah. What? What's number two then? Probably C. Okay. I say A. And then what about three? I say C. Okay. And what will be the last one? C. Okay, you're all wrong. No one's right. <laughs> All terribly wrong. Because <laughs> you guys are making assumptions. What assumptions are you guys making? She's a feminist and she's a bank teller. What well, any of those are two. No, what, 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 what? B is number one. Where did you guys get that information? The B was number one. Um, she's for indigenous people's rights and she participated in the unsolved murders of women. But does that guarantee you number one is B? No. So then where, is that information relevant? But none of them are None of them are really information as far as because there's no, it doesn't state she's a bank teller. Uh -huh. Right. There's no evidence that she's a bank teller. 
I'm going to tell you this. All this information on the left-hand side, all this, irrelevant. Has nothing to do with the problem. Doesn't help you answer the, the problem at all. This is why I say the psychology and our logic is two separate things. We start making a story and start telling, because we're really good at making up stories. I don't know, human beings, at least we're really good at making up stories. We love to make up stories. So then we'll say, oh, she's a feminist. Why? Well, because this and this. And we start building this image of her in our head and we have all this background story. It has nothing to do with the facts. There is a correct order here though. There is a right answer. Because then I'll give you guys a clue. How many categories do we have? Mm. How many categories are we working with? Two? Mm. I say three. What three? Single, out of spoken, and smart. No? No, 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 no. No, no. I said that information wasn't important. Oh. So, bank teller. Feminist. Okay. Oh, okay. And yoga classes. So she belong. So the categories can be: she's a bank teller, right? Yeah. She's an active feminist, and she's a yoga student. Those are the three categories. Remember my Venn diagram examples. Put that in a Venn diagram. What's the correct order then? For a second so let's go back she's a bank teller that's a right so anywhere in the bank right B is an active feminist anywhere in the active feminist circle right but C what happens with C what does C say She's an active feminist and a big time. Right. So where can she fall in the graph? In the right in the back? We're in the middle between them. What happens or where they intersect? Right. What happens to the probability then? What happens to the area? If it's only one of the intersect. Smaller? It's smaller. Because she has to be both instead of just one. And then what was the last one? What was four? What did it say she was? Because she's all of them. And what area would that be? That small little In the triangle middle. right there. Then what happened to the probability again? It decreased. Notice what's going on. Because you're putting more and more conditions on her, she has to be this and this and this. You're making it less likely that it's true. Do you guys see that? Yeah. But it's the stereotyping and it's all the other psychology stuff that we get confused about. Let me change the problem and say, what are the chances she's a lawyer, she's a doctor, and she's running for office? Versus she's just a lawyer or she's just a doctor. Do you see how just being one of the categories is more likely than being part of all three categories? Mm -hmm. So what's the correct order then to go back? What would be one? Either A or B. Right, because this is all we know, right? Either this category or that category, so they're tied. 
And what would be the next one? What would be two? B. B, because it's already, should you be part of those two groups? And then three? Three, B. right. She's part of all three groups. Notice what's happening. This is why I put and. If you have and, she's a banker. And see how the probability is getting, let me go back, smaller and smaller and smaller. The more ands mm -hmm. I put in there. Because she has to do all those things. Mm -hmm. how, what happens if I increase the probability? How would I increase the probability? You can put or. Right, because then I just say, or this, or this, or this, right? Mm -hmm. Let me ask everybody. What's the probability, let's say I got a coin and I flipped it. What's the probability it's going to be heads or tails? 50-50. No. If I said, I had a coin and I flipped it, I said, I bet you it's going to be heads or tails. What are the chances of me winning that bet? 100. 100. You see how I increase the probability? Using, it'll be heads or tails. If I flip the coin and I say, oh, it's going to be heads and tails, what's the probability? What's the probability of it being both at the same time? Zero. Zero. I'm going to start betting with you guys because you're paying attention. Like, <laughs> but do you see, and is going to decrease the probability, or, remember those indicator words, or is going to increase the probability. You can see this like when you sign up for classes. I'm going to take this class and this class and this class. What are the chances you're going to get an A in all those classes if you keep adding classes? Smaller and smaller. Smaller is, mm -hmm. Right, because you're increasing the conditions. You're making it harder and harder, right? Yeah. So and is not always more. And could be a less probability, less of a chance. So don't forget that. Or is how you increase the probability. This is what that professor was teaching his students who took Vegas. It's like, how do you increase or decrease probabilities? Any questions about that? No. no. Okay, so I know it's getting late. Uh, there is some other stuff and some other examples and stuff to talk about, but I think you guys can do that on your own time. It's nothing too much. What I do want to uh, mention, though, what is important, though, I'm going to skip to that, are two concepts, implied premises and multiple conclusions. And Vaughn talks about this in the PDF. Implied premises are premises that are not explicitly stated. They're underlying premises. Like when people say, uh, reading between the lines. It's what people don't say. And this is what you're looking out for. You want to see, what are they not saying? What are they assuming in the background to make the argument? So the example here the use of condoms is completely unnatural. They've been manufactured for the explicit purpose of interfering in the natural process of procreation. Therefore, the use of condoms should be bad. What are they assuming here about that conclusion? That anything that interferes in the natural process of procreation should be banned. No, they said that. What did they not say? What's the information they didn't clarify?
Why would you ban something? When do we ban something? Why would we ban something? Because it's bad. Right. But did they ever say that? No. But they implied that, didn't they? Yeah. So that's an implied premise. That's a background assumption they're making. They never said that, though. What are they assuming is bad? How do you know if something is bad? Or what's the other assumption they're making? How can you tell bad from good according to this argument? Right, something unnatural. They're making that assumption. If it's unnatural, then it must be bad, right? And if it's bad, then what should you do? Ban it. Ban it. But do you see all that information they left out? Mm -hmm. They never mm -hmm. proved that something unnatural is bad, and they never proved that if it's bad, then it should be banned. The bad part, the moral part of something being bad or good, they assumed it, but they never stated it. They never proved that. So that's what I say, be careful about these assumptions that people make in the background. The other concept that I want to make sure everybody covers is uh, for, uh, multiple conclusions. So this is the rule, and this is in Vaughn's PDF as well. An argument has only one conclusion at a time. You cannot have one argument and two different conclusions. So the first example up here on the box on the top. All women are moral rational. Andrea is a woman, so Andrea is rational, so Andrea is moral. What's the conclusion up here on the first box? What number? Three and four. Three and four. So we have two different conclusions. How many arguments do we have then? Two, two conclusions, two arguments. That one conclusion per argument. So how did they get to this conclusion, number three, that she's rational? What was the premises? What backs up three? All. All women are. All women. Mm -hmm. And then what else do we know? That all women are mortal. So. But in order to back up that she's rational, it says all women are mortal and rational, right? Right. We, oh, Andrea's a woman. Right. Therefore, we know so she must be rational, right? Right. So the one in red is the first argument. But I said one conclusion, one argument. We have a second conclusion, number four. How did they get to four? Right. What were the premises for four? All women, women are mortal. Okay. And rational. And then what? Andrea's a woman. Andrea's a woman. So then she must be? Mortal. Right. Two different arguments. Even if they use the same premises, two different arguments because they end up in two different places. Two different conclusions. Right. Now, the one on the bottom is a little trickier. Killing children is evil. Children will be killed in Bosnia. Therefore, someone was doing something evil in Bosnia. When someone does something evil, he should be punished. So whoever killed children in Bosnia should be punished. What are the conclusions here? What number? Five. Five is, right. Five is one conclusion. What's the other conclusion? You have two conclusions in there. Three? And then whenever someone... Yeah. Because, remember, therefore, all oh, right, those were indicator words of a conclusion. How did they get to three? Killing children uh, is evil. 
Okay. And they're being killed in Bosnia. Right. So one and two get the three. How do they get the five? Um, four, because it says when someone does something evil, he should be punished. But is that the only premise they have? And um, for killing children is evil. Actually, it's one through four. Now, notice, what happened to three? Three used to be the conclusion, but what does it turn into now? A premise. A premise. You can stack arguments. But what used to be the conclusion is now one of the steps, one of the premises for your new conclusion. We do the same thing in math class, right? You solve the problem and you use that solution and those steps, right? For a bigger problem. That's essentially what's going on. So when philosophers, when we write papers, this is essentially what we're doing. I prove a smaller argument and then I use that small argument to prove a larger argument. Everybody get that? Yes. Okay. Now to wrap it up, because I'm going really far, a lot of the videos that I posted are gonna help you with the fallacies. I'm gonna skip the fallacies because there's a lot of great videos about each of the fallacies. And they do, they have like animation and stuff. It's a lot more entertaining than I am. And they explain very well some good examples. Uh, the last thing I want to cover though is the constructing, deconstructing arguments. Vaughn talks about one and two in the PDF. And it gives you some examples on how to do those. So go over those examples and he gives you step by step. Three is my method. And I'm going to show you my method. It's what well, the basic standard form is what I'm calling it. That's the method that we've been kind of working with so far, is that how do you take apart an argument? And I said, philosophers are really good at building arguments and taking apart arguments. You can think of us like, we're like mechanics or something, right? You can build the engine, you can take apart the engine. So, for philosophers, I can see your argument, I can take it apart and see, well, does it work? What are all the pieces? So these are good steps. This is a good algorithm or, or a list of steps that you can do when you want to evaluate and see, this is a good argument or not. Break it apart. So the first thing you should do is cross out non-declarative statements. So remember I said questions, utterances, things that can't be true or false, right? Cross those out. Those are not going to help with any argument. That's just extra information. Circle the indicator words. So when you see and, or, if, then, therefore, circle those words. Those are important, right? And then I said, take the statements and then replace them with variables so you can see the structure. So the first statement, you put a P, second Q, et cetera. And then look for the conclusion. Remember I said, if there's no conclusion, there's no argument. So find the conclusion and underline it twice so you know where it's at. And then if it has a conclusion, well, there must be some premises, right? Underline those ones so you know how they got to that conclusion. And then what you want to do in the bottom is, number six, reorganize it. Just like a map, this is exactly what I'm saying about like word problems. You take the paragraph, you break it apart, and then you reorganize it into a problem, right? That you can solve. So you put the mm -hmm. premises first, go line, and put the conclusion at the bottom. And then evaluate it. Are the statements true? Now that you've broken down, check the premises. Are they true or not? Check the structure. Is it a valid structure or not? See if there are any implied premises or, or do they leave out information or making assumptions like the example we saw for the comments. Then that, all those things tell you, well, is this a good argument or not? So work with these. There's some examples that I posted on the PowerPoint. These are practice problems. 
take it apart. Where are the statements? Where, follow the, the instructions, follow the directions. Don't, just like math, don't skip any steps because then you'll get yourself confused later. Go okay. through step by step and see if you can take these and then reform them. So essentially what I was saying, take something like this, this argument example here, and then turn it into something where premises come first and the conclusion comes last. And I'm just kind of curious, what would this look like? Actually, let me, I'll do it with you guys real quick. All right. So, let me pull this up a bit. If I take this argument, if John killed Bill in self-defense and he did not commit murder, he did act in self-defense. He did not commit. If I take this and reform it into variables, what would I say? If if p, if right, if p then. Yeah. Then Q. Q. Almost. What do we miss? There's an opposite. Not Q. Not Q. Yeah, not Q. Because it's it's saying the opposite, right? It's saying he did not commit murder. Mm -hmm. What would be the second premise? P. He did self defense. P, right? Because it's essentially saying. The same thing, right? Mm -hmm. So then what would be the conclusion? Therefore, not, not Q. Right. You see how I translated it? This is what I'm hoping you guys can be able to do. Translate and see. Now I can look and it's easier to evaluate than just trying to read that paragraph. Because you can flip, you can make, you get in, uh, replace, remember the variables. If it rains, and the streets are not wet. Like you can do anything you want and see if it works out or not. So there's some examples in the book, and I included some examples of, well, not in the book, but the PDF I gave you guys and the, uh, and the PowerPoint here. You can work out some examples. So those are your study materials to go over. If you have questions, you're not sure if you're on the right track or you're not sure if you did it, the problem right, yeah, email me. Let me know and then I'll walk you through it and see. Okay. Uh, and, then the, and then this is why it makes it easier to evaluate. So let me go into the other view real quick. Is it a good argument or not? Once you break it down, right, like this, then you can start seeing, well, does this make sense or not? Mm -hmm. um, the fallacies, they're really common. Like I mentioned, there's a lot of good examples and videos that I included. Uh, they give you examples of bad mistakes in reasoning where people make assumptions. And you can go through those. Uh, there's plenty of YouTube videos that give you good examples as well. Just look up being in the question or equivocation. And so there's definitions for all of them and go back. And so when we talk about ethics, this is what I'm saying. I'm spending all this time teaching you guys this stuff because when we get to the book this week, we're going to start looking at ethical arguments, what is right and what is wrong. And I want you guys to be able to think about this in a very logical way. Instead of just relying on our emotions and say, oh, well, I, I don't know, I just feels wrong or something. We need some more proof than that. And then I highly recommend, this is where we're headed. So this I included as well. I made this, this is a map. These are all the theories that we're going to cover this semester. 
Each box is, a, is its theory. They have a different view of ethics. Each one has a different view of ethics. So this is an intro class, essentially, of ethics. Because you can spend, I know those philosophers who do, your entire career on just one of these boxes. But just like an intro to psychology or an intro to anything else, I'm just giving you an overview, a little taste of each one. Okay. Uh, since it's a summer session, I had to cut out some though, because I just do time constraints. So value theory, unfortunately, we're not gonna be able to cover, uh, but we will start with meta ethics, because I think it's foundational. That's why it's at the top. So to understand all the ethical theories later, you should understand meta ethics first. And that's where we'll start this week. So make sure you're looking at those. And logic is really helpful. This is, if you're interested in, in the summer two course or when I teach logic, I'm, the next step is to teach you guys how to do this. Because this is how computers run. So instead of true or false, like we've been doing, it's zeros and ones. That's all computers are doing. It's all just the basic stuff that we just did. If you notice, P then Q and P so Q, what structure is that? It's modus yeah. yeah. It's a valid structure. How do I know it's a valid structure? Because every single situation is true. And that's what the computer does. It just goes through and see everyone is one. That's all it's doing. Computers are really not that complicated. They think they're complicated, but they're really not. So if you guys are interested, I'm teaching logic. I think everybody should take logic before they take ethics. But, you know. Any last questions? No. Okay. No. That's it.